Hello and welcome back to UMETSAT for the summary of the third week of this massive open online course on the oceans. I hope you've enjoyed this week's uh, looking at the ocean circulation. I found the end of the week exercise really interesting, like dropping little ducks in just to see how much effect you can have on the ocean surface over a period of time by polluting just one point in the oceans. And this was my example, so I dropped a duck in just off the west coast of Ireland. And I find it incredible just how much ocean can be affected from that one point. So this was a question from Malcolm who was asking about can we actually monitor some of this plastic debris from space? There are several platforms you can do to do this. You're not necessarily imaging the individual items, but you're looking at how the plastic on the surface changes the reflectivity of the surface, the little waves and ripples on the surface, so you're using radars and optical sensors to do this kind of thing. So this can be done. Murdoch raised an interesting question. Um, he was asking about how can you really find out about deep water flows and patterns from the satellites? Because, of course, you're not measuring them directly. So he's expressing a degree of scepticism here. And I think this is really important. This is an example of the scientific process in action. As satellite providers, we provide data about what we can see from the surface. We know a lot about physics. So we can say, well, given the physics of the ocean, what could possibly give rise to the patterns we see on the surface? And this would include some deep water circulation patterns. But we then need to match this with some data from buoys and things to really prove that what we think is going on is what is going on. In this case, when we make a model of the ocean, we should be able to make a prediction that can be tested using another source of data. And that's how we know what we know. Everything else is totally up for debate, and that's how the scientific process works. The measurement of sea level, given that there are tides, currents, swells, storms, and variations in pressure. You're absolutely right. All of this variation is what we measure, and so this is part of the signal that we see in the altimeter data. We see all the tides, which we can predict, so we can take that effect out, but the swell, the change in pressure, and everything, this is all part of it. So on a moment basis, we can see the instantaneous effect of the ocean. So what we do to see the climate effect, so to see the changes in sea level rise, is we average over time so that we can take out all of the effects of the instantaneous ocean, so to do with the pressure changes, to do with instantaneous wave changes, to do with the swell, so we can see the average change. And of course, when we publish those data sets, all of how we've done that aver averaging is part of what we publish. Sheila um, was asking about how we actually get the data from the Argo floats. So there's a network of satellites, many of them are meteorological satellites, that are doing other jobs, and on them they have a little Argo receiver. So when they're overhead, they're what picks up the data from the Argo floats and then transmits it back to us. And we're part of that system. So there are many satellites, not necessarily all, that are capable of the data transfer, but enough to make sure that we can get the data from those floats nice and quickly. The atmospheric conditions, when we're looking at uh, the ocean surface from the spacecraft, of course, there's the atmosphere in the way. And to ocean scientists, the atmosphere is a contribution of noise. And it takes quite some effort to try and remove the effects of the atmosphere from the data so that we're just seeing the effect of the ocean surface itself. And everything you raise here is exactly part of the problem. Particulates, aerosols, dust, all of how we retrieve those and take them out of the data. One thing that's happening now, which I'm finding quite exciting, is of course this to other people is data. This data on dust, volcanic ash, forest fires. So actually trying to retrieve the ocean properties and the atmosphere properties at the same time to the best quality of both communities is an interesting scientific challenge that's being looked at at the moment. And I think that'll be a really important thing uh, for both communities in the future. This is an observation from Liz, who was just, at the end of the week, reflecting on some of the stuff she's seen from, say, Tim's Peak book, um, some of his fo photos from the ISS. And Helen Chersky, one of her thoughts um, on, on some of this is, we really should think of the ocean as being part of our life support system here on Earth. It's not something that's external to us. It's something we interact with, and it helps keep us alive. It's not neutral to us. It's not just a place over there. Our life support here on Earth is very much connected 
with the oceans. This is something that Helen Chersky is very uh, keen on communicating, the relation that we have as humans to our ocean environment. It's part of our life support system. And I think she's very right in, in picking that up. Thank you for all the questions you've had during the course of this week. I hope you've really enjoyed looking at the dynamics of the ocean. This week we're going to turn to the life of the ocean, so looking at phytoplankton and climate and the amount of life that exists and thrives within the ocean environment. For me this is quite an exciting week, we get onto the health of fish stocks and things. So I really hope you enjoy this week and carry on asking all your lovely questions in the forum. Thank you.